This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Silence was a passion film for Martin Scorsese and one that took him 27 years to complete and get to theaters. This film made it through decades of development hell, lawsuits, incredibly harsh terrain, and questions if it would ever see the light of day. What resulted is perhaps one of the greatest religious films in the history of cinema, taking the many tropes of religiously based films and subverting them in a thought-provoking way that does not give the viewer any satisfactory or necessarily feel-good answers. And its only real response to the questions it poses throughout the film? The original novel, Silence, was written by a Japanese Catholic author, Shusaku Endo, in 1966, depicting the story of the persecution of the Japanese Christians. Silence had received adaptations previously with Japanese director Masahiro Shinodo bringing the story to the big screen back in 1977, and Portuguese director Mario Grillo introducing an adaptation known as The Eyes of Asia in 1997. But between those two adaptations, another director without any national ties to the story came across the tale. Enter Martin Scorsese. Scorsese was someone who could resonate with Endo's writings, as he himself had grown up a Catholic and had even desired to join the priesthood in his early years. Next thing I know, uh, meet this Father Prince Bay, I said, well, I want to be like this. And so I wound up at Cathedral Prep, I think it was called, a, a kind of a preparatory seminary here in New York. But within, I was about 14 or 15, and, and that's the age when everything clicks another way. And I realized that, uh, uh, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. So the vocation, uh, you don't become, uh, you don't dedicate your life to, uh, to Jesus in a sense of being a cleric. Uh, unless you really have the calling, unless you really, this is not something to, be, in other words, it, it isn't to be like somebody else. You have to, it has right. to come from you. Right. It's a very serious and very uh, sacred calling. With this background, Endo's story of Christian faith being tested through suffering, with the lands of the Shogunat taking their stage at the analog for Jesus's journey through the Roman Empire, gripped Scorsese when he first read it on a visit to Japan in 1989. After receiving it from an archbishop who met him in a meeting after the showcase of his previous religious film, the 1988's The Last Temptation of Christ, the imagery and storytelling of silence convinced Scorsese that it would be worthwhile for him to adapt. But for many years, he felt unsure of how to realize it. Beyond a deal Scorsese made with Chechi Gori Pictures, a company ran by Italian producer Chechi Gori, to fund the picture, there wasn't much news to be found. Around 1990, Jay Cox and I tried to write a version of the script but I realized I was not ready for the material. So we put it aside. The production on this film would then go silent, you could say. And for this video, take a second to sit back and enjoy the ambient, representative 20-year silence on Scorsese's film, brought to you by our sponsor, Squarespace. If you enjoyed the silence, go to squarespace.com slash frame voyager to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now back to the production of silence. It took 20 years for Scorsese to believe the time had come to adapt Silence, and in 2009 he went with his team to Japan, visiting Nagasaki, where Endo had set the original book, to scout for locations to learn the history and meet with the descendants of the persecuted Christians. However, Scorsese didn't follow through at the time, instead working on 2010's Shutter Island and 2011's Hugo. In December 2011, Scorsese announced that Silence would be his next film, but by March 2012 he dropped out again to make Wolf of Wall Street, and in January 2013 after Wolf of Wall Street's filming had wrapped, he's decided to put his foot down and genuinely commit himself to the picture, insisting that Silence would be his next film and he wouldn't take on other projects until it was done, which Silence is a fascinating film to go to after making Wolf of Wall Street.
Before putting the pieces together, Scorsese had to deal with a lawsuit launched against him by the production company Chechi Gori over the film. The suit began in 2012 during the making of Wolf of Wall Street, with Chechi Gori claiming Scorsese had breached his contract with him by not producing the film in the 1990s after the company had allegedly invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into the production. Scorsese's reps called the claims absurd and vowed to win, which is kind of ironic that a suit complaining about silence not being made was delaying its production. But in 2014, the issue was buried with Scorsese and Chachigori coming to an undisclosed settlement. With the legal troubles out of the way, funding and casting was secured for 2015. They would finally begin principal filming on January 30th, 2015, 26 years after Scorsese had secured the rights for this film. The shooting was set to take place in Taiwan, and then actually proved to be quite interesting when telling a story about Japanese culture and working with a crew from vastly different cultures. We had a crew of over 750 people, and it was made up of Taiwanese, Japanese, Australians, Italians, British, and Americans. Yes, it was complex and uh, confusing for a little while at first. <laughs> there were language barriers, a lot of cultural differences. However, everyone really wanted to make this picture and they adapted so quickly and, and we became uh, blended uh, like a determined family. The locations they had scouted previously in Japan, the actual locations of these historical sites, ended up being too costly for the production budget, which is why they ended up in Taiwan after scouting locations in New Zealand, Vancouver, and Northern California. The coastline they found in Taiwan actually lent itself very well to the starkness and heaviness that this film portrays, with spectacular backdrops rendered almost beautifully hostile. And the backdrop wasn't the only thing that was hostile. From torrential rainstorms to earthquakes, to extreme heat. Just the challenges were unbelievable. We were working on mountainsides and in oceans and crossing rivers. We even shot in a typhoon. I mean, it was a very, very uh, arduous shoot. Um, a lot of mountain climbing. In these harsh conditions, the entire crew would have had to hike almost everywhere, making this an incredibly arduous and taxing shoot. Climbing mountains like that was uh, posed definite challenges, but when you see Marty walking up a hill, you go, okay, here we go, that's, yeah, we gotta follow suit here. This was equally hard on both Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver, who for this film had to maintain a very strict and limited diet to portray the characters who went through near starvation in extreme circumstances. One of my favorite moments was we were on a boat and they had the front of the boat tied to a big rope that they pushed out into the water and the entire crew and cast and the extras are all on the shore and they called the lunch break. We're like, oh no, that's fine. We'll just stay out here in the boat. So we had like a panoramic view of everybody eating on the shore, you know, like passing around dumplings and all these like noodles, you know, like turning away food being like, oh no, I'm done. And you could still see food that were left on the plate. That was one of my favorite moments. <laughs> it creates a great deal of appreciation for all the things that you've taken for granted previously. Now we get more into the principal photography of this film, with cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto taking the reins for this film. He is also known for, you know, Killers of the Flower Moon, Barbie, Brokeback Mountain, Wolf of Wall Street, and countless other films. And he's a highly regarded cinematographer who is known for meticulous setups, unconventional camera work, and visceral images with rich use of color. For this film, Martin Scorsese wanted everyone to move at a bit of a slower pace when filming. There would be no fast cuts, no quick cut scenes, but a very classical style of shooting. I think he wanted everybody in the beginning of the movie to calm down and start to think and feel about what they are seeing. Scorsese and Prieto were very deliberate to make sure that this was filmed almost entirely from the perspective of the priests. And in some cases, that meant doing things compositionally different than one normally would on a film. In one such case, during the scene where some Japanese converts are executed while the two priests hide on the cliff in the distance with absolutely no way to help them, Scorsese and Prieto set the scene at a wide angle. And after these Japanese converts die, they convey that feeling of distance and helplessness by the two priests. And when I saw the dailies, I just couldn't get over the fact that Marty had done it in a wide shot and not with any coverage, no close-ups, no two shots. And it's very slow, but it's so powerful. You feel so deeply about it. And when I said to Marty on the set, I can't believe you didn't do any coverage, that's so brave. And he said, yes, because that wide shot is about helplessness. The priests are watching and they can't do anything to stop it. All of these things really 
in many cases were a joy to compose the frame. It really was, uh, especially in widescreen. This was incorporated through several other scenes, also very apparent when Rodrigo is in prison, and much of what you see happening during these scenes is from behind the bars of the prison, obscuring the scene so you can feel what this character does in the moment, again giving you an acute sense of helplessness and dread. It's moments like these throughout the film that really draw you in and immerse you in the world and suffering and doubt he is going through. For Prieto and Scorsese, the biggest source of inspiration for a lot of these scenes was the environment they were in, which helped them to scale down and strip away unnecessary elements the nature around us, we really embraced it. I had designed as much as I could the film, but when I got to the locations, something happened. The landscape itself said a great deal. Once we got the camera in position, we felt that the image was telling us more than what we thought. It's, it's too... Mm -hmm. And so I began to strip away the unnecessary visual components of a scene, not needing a certain angle, concentrating on uh, what the landscape looked like, the color of the grass. The shapes of the rocks, the ocean, the waves, the mist that came and went. This resulted in a stunning cinematic experience. Even if you don't end up connecting with the story, it's just compositionally beautiful with excellent cinematography, which picked up a nomination that year, of course, for best cinematography. And we will mention one other aspect about this film that is quite fascinating. It's almost lack of any music throughout the film. You're treated to various ambient sounds that fill the void of that silence greeted with the occasional scores that you barely notice throughout the film. The silence is deafening and haunting at times in the film's most emotional and torturous moments. Financially, the film was a box office bomb though, ultimately making just under $24 million on a budget of $50 million. Though, given how much of a passion project this was for Scorsese, I kind of doubt that he cared all that much. Despite the turnout though, critics were much kinder to the film, with it sitting currently at 86% on Rotten Tomatoes' tomato meter, if you care about that. With the site summing up the critical impressions of the movie as a thoughtfully emotional, resonant look at spirituality and human nature that stands among the director's finest works. Audiences were more divided, with one criticism being an inability to relate to the themes, and in a way, that does add up, sort of. For many though, I think the complicated nature of this religious film gets lost a bit in translation, depending on the specific viewpoint and background of the viewer. This film offers no comforting answers to its relentless questioning of religious doubt, suffering, and silence. It instead challenges the history of westernized religion, forcing culture, theology, and enlightenment onto the so-called primitive populations around the world, and challenges the notion that all martyrdom is in some way meaningful. Taking most religious presuppositions on missionary work and martyrdom to task and exposing their flawed and contradictory nature. Deeply questioning the Christ figure narrative that is present in almost any modern film franchise, which offers up suffering and sacrifice as always serving a greater and beneficial purpose. Just as Scorsese sets these characters up to be, religious heroes set to fix what's broken in a foreign world. In the end, however, the hero's dedication to martyrdom and tenets of their faith bring death and suffering to others leaving you to question, do you choose humanity or, based on the rigorous confines of a religion, your own soul? It's the perfect question to challenge if their work of religion and suffering is actually for the benefit of others or a selfish and prideful ploy for the easement of their own soul, for their own works towards a better eternal reward and faith and religious fundamentalism that often comes at the expense of others. And in that sense, I think this film is relatable to both religious and non-religious viewers, as it can challenge a variety of strongly held beliefs and lead us to question the negative impacts that our beliefs have on others. And if you made it through this section of heavy content, may we suggest another Scorsese production for you. Check out the 165-day production of Killers of the Flower Moon.